Okay, fantastic. Welcome to Mammal Tracks and Signs. Hi, my name is Naomi and I'm going to take the next hour or so to walk you through some basic beginner skills into how to identify the mammal tracks and signs that you can find in Wales. So in the UK, but we're focusing really on Wales. So thank you very much for the West Wales Biological Information Centre for having me today. I'm really excited to, uh, to get started. So um, just a little introduction about me first. So like I said, hi, my name is Naomi. I am a graduate student from Aberystwyth University. So I studied animal behaviour. Um, since graduating, I've been um, working with a variety of different natural uh, conservation charities across, across Mid Wales. So uh, I've done a bit of work with the RSPB, with the Wildlife Trust, and I've also been lucky enough to help out with the Vincent Wildlife Trust Pine Martin Recovery Project, moving animals from Scotland down to Mid Wales, and that was really fun. So what I do for my work now is mostly bats and ecology related. I'm part of our local bat group and I also take care of bats as, uh, as a bat carer for the Bat Conservation Trust. So uh, I have quite a wide variety of interests spanning from birds to mammals, but I'm going to chat about mammals today. So our mammals in the UK, they're quite special in that uh, we generally don't get to see them very often because we're tucked up in bed. Many of them are nocturnal, so the majority of our animals in this country are prey species. So that means that they are food for other animals and because of this means that they don't really like going out and about in the middle of the day. So they're coming out at night and so that unfortunately means that we don't get to see them that often and we have to decide and investigate who has been active in our gardens and our green spaces from the clues that they leave behind. So I always say you have to play detective when you're looking at mammal tracks and signs because what can we find that has been left behind? So I like to break it down into the four P's. So starting with the top three P's which are prints, so footprints, poo for poo, and pickings for things like nuts, seeds, homes, prey remains, the sorts of things that animals leave behind. And of course, then the fourth is place. And I use that place to inform on the other things that I found. So thinking about where we are, what time of year it is, things like that. So before we get started, I just want to share with you two really important tips. First of all, is um, use a scale rule whenever you're out and about taking pictures of things. The amount of times I've wanted to take pictures of a footprint or a poo, taken a picture, gone home to look at it, and I have no idea how big it is. So I know you're probably not wandering around with a ruler in your pocket, unless you're slightly strange, but you probably almost always have a pen or something similar. So it's always worth having a scale whenever you're putting something next to a poo or something to take a picture of it. Secondly, I'd like to recommend you using a field notebook. Now, this is my field notebook. I have it right here. So this is my field notebook. I've been using this current notebook for about three years now. And I like it because you can write whatever you want in there. You can use pictures, you can write in code. It's a great way of learning things because learning is a very unique process. And uh, I find that learning my own little my own little rhymes, my own little stories helps quite a lot when uh, it comes to learning different species. So I would definitely recommend using a nature journal or something like that. So just to start, we're going through the, uh, the four Ps really quickly before we get started. So prints, looking at what type of print have we got? What are the toes looking like? Does it have claws? How are the toes positioned and how big is the print? We can use helpful things like cheat sheets. So here I have from the Mammal Society, uh, a lovely page of prints, but I'm sure you're wondering, that's not actually really what animal feet look like. How, how, can, I, how can I tell the difference when, when we're out and about? Well, just try and think of your own human hand and think if what happens if you painted your own human hand and smacked your hand on the wall or on a table or something. That is probably the sort of thing that we'd end up leaving behind. So we're looking for four really long fingers on the top, little thumb at the side, and a really big palm at the bottom. So it's these things that we're putting together, these clues that we're putting together that tells us that that is a human handprint. And so we do the same for animal prints as well. So we're looking at the way that the toes are distributed, we're looking at the claws and the claw shape, and then we're also looking at the size of the pad in relation to the toes as well. So just a quick example here, print of a badger. So badgers have got lovely big 
toes, lovely big toes, lovely big pad of the foot there, and lots of lovely young, long claws. So we can use our cheat sheet to sort of superimpose on top of that print that helps us identify that that was a badger. So moving on to poo. Firstly, poo is great because it can tell you so many things about the animal that, uh, that, that did it. Uh, mammal or bird poo is something that you can tell from an instant look. First of all, because we've got slightly different bodies, birds and animals poo in different ways. So man mammals pee and poo differently because we have two separate openings. Birds are very different. So they have one opening called a cloaca and all of the urine and feces come out in one little pee poo packet. And I'm sure you're all very familiar with this lovely white splodge, probably upon the roof of your lovely cleaned car. But this is white poo because it is full of uric acid. So that's present in all of our wee. But because bird poo mixes up with the feces, it creates a, a lovely white staining. And so if we see white, we know that it's not going to be a mammal poo. So that's uh, one tip that I can give you straight away. So. When we're looking at poo, we're looking for what type of poo? We're looking for the colour, the texture, the consistency, the smell. Safety first, never ever touch poo with your bare hands. Or if you do, make sure you wash them afterwards. You know, 20 seconds, we all know how to wash our hands well now. But poo, like I said, is very important. Don't, don't shy away from the smell. Don't shy away from it, because when it comes to animals like the mustelid family, the weasel family, Getting your nose into knowing which poo is which can really, really help you clinch that ID. So looking at pickings, we're looking for feeding signs, prey remains, activity, and even homes of animals. So we're looking for nests, food leavings, collapsed vegetation from animals moving around, all sorts of things that shows that the animal has been there in the environment. And then obviously, lastly, we're looking at place. So have a think about where you are. What habitat are you in? Are you in a woodland, a farmland or by the coast? Similarly, how did you get there? Because if you're somewhere near a lot of people or in an urban area, that will sometimes dictate what sort of animals will be around. Similarly, always a good idea to think about when it last rained, especially when you're looking at footprints because mud consistency can vary how prints look. And um, similarly, when it is in time, uh, in terms of the season. So um, we're thinking about hibernating animals. We're thinking about animals' behaviour and making a, a, a generalised guess as far as, uh, as far as all of our clues can be put together. So we're very, very lucky in Britain and Wales that we have quite a lot of lovely different mammals. So I have tried to simplify it a little bit by breaking them down into their uh, taxonomic groups. So that's essentially um, groups that they get put into based on um, DNA and relatability. So we're looking at things like the leopards, like the rabbits and hares, rodents, like mice and voles, rabbits and, uh, rats and squirrels, insectivores, like the mole, shrew and the hedgehog, Carnivores, wild foxes, wild foxes, wild cats, foxes, dogs and cats that we have at home. The mustelid group, my favourite group, uh, which includes the weasels, badger, polecat, otter, things like that. And then we're going to have a look quickly at the non-terrestrial mammals that we have, the bats. Because although they don't leave prints, they do leave a lot of poo. So it's always worth learning what that can look like. So starting off with our smallest mammals, the rodents. So these little guys, they tend to not really leave many signs when they're out and about. Due to their size, they tend not to like to show themselves. So their footprints and their poo will often be hidden in vegetation and scrub and things like that. A brilliant way to sort of get to grips with what sort of mammals you have in the area is to utilize other species. So things like barn owls and tawny owls will eat these mammals, all of these small mammals, and they will produce pellets. And so I'm not sure how many of you have had the chance to dissect an owl pellet, but it is such good fun. And an owl will eat a small animal and sometimes cough up a pellet that is an entire skeleton. So complete with the jaw and the teeth, you can get down to species level identification when it comes to the rodents. So I would recommend looking at the Barn Owl Conservation Trust website for that. I'll give a whole load of resources right at the end, so don't worry about writing them down now. But it's always worth having a think that you can find instant, uh, you can find evidence of animals, of mammals, 
in uh, in the lifetime in the lifestyles of uh, of birds as well so it's always worth to think about so like i said with the small mammals you generally won't find many signs out and about this is the one this is one of the very few um, field signs I've found by a small vole. We've got here a feeding station and a latrine. So here we see the tiny green poo of the field vole. So it's green because they eat uh, the soft rush, this juncus here. And so they like to eat the green chlorophyll filled outer, outer sheaths and then leave the pith, the white unnutritious bit behind. And so they tend to pee and feed in the same place, not very hygienic really, but it allows us to be able to um, find them when we're out and about and that makes our job a lot easier. So we're looking at a mixture of poo and pieces. And so bearing in mind, uh, field vole and water vole can look quite similar. With a field vole, you're looking at very small poo, so smaller than a grain of rice, and their pickings will be about four millimeters or less. With a water vole you're looking at um, large, larger than rice grain size poo and pickings that are between five and eight centimeters. There's a picture coming up soon. So another animal that I suppose we don't tend to really like I suppose is the brown rat. So these move into the sort of larger mammal, larger rodents now, so rats, squirrels and the water vole. Um, those, uh, they tend to have more noticeable field characteristics, but like I said before, because they're prey animals, we'll probably never ever see them out in the field. So these are the pickings from the water vole, so that's my adult human hand there. So we're looking at about eight to five, five to eight centimetres of length and that classic 45 degree cut on the edge there. So we see that all of these pieces have the 45 degree edge cut. Now the field vole will also show this, so don't get fooled like I did when I found that field vole latrine and thought, oh my gosh, it's a water vole, because um, no, sadly I got a little bit too enthusiastic. So it's always worth having a think about where you are in terms of the habitat when it comes to water vole and whether they're present in your area. So your local mammal recorder will be able to um, give you some information about that and you will also be able to find information on um, the Adarin website which combines all of the uh, information and records from all four of the Welsh local environmental record centres and puts them all into one lovely big map. Of course because water vole are protected you might not be able to pinpoint exactly where they are but generally if they're in your catchment chances are you might be lucky and find one. So harvest mice are one of our smallest mammal. I think they may be the smallest rodent in the UK. I think they are. So they're about the size of a thumb. And this is probably one of the only pickings that you'll find out and about that is a, uh, a home. So unless you're uh, someone that likes looking at bird nest boxes where a lot of mice and dormice like to hide, um, this is probably the only structure that you'll find out and about. And so this harvest mouse ball has been tightly woven together from dry grass and is no bigger than a tennis ball. And again, think about your place. So harvest mice like arable, they like um, places with wildflowers, um, hay meadows, things like that. Not really very widespread in Wales, unfortunately, but it's definitely worth having a look at the records where you are. And so when it comes to pickings, I think rodents are one of the best groups when it comes to pickings because they just leave stuff everywhere. And pickings are great for finding animals that are a bit more elusive. So the dormouse, a protected species, generally not able to go out looking for dormouse because to check nest boxes, to check dormouse nest boxes, you have to, of course, be licensed. And so looking for nuts and different gnaw shapes on nuts is a fantastic way of looking for dormouse wherever you are. So different, different rodents will have different feeding strategies. And the dormouse is quite unique in that it has, whenever it eats nuts, it leaves a lovely smooth circle around the feeding edge of the nut. If you imagine what a rodent jaws look like with the incisors at the front, the two big incisors at the top and the two at the bottom, you can see that the voles and the mice make a very, very sort of classic rodent chew mark around the, around the edges there. Whereas the hazel, the hazel dormouse will, uh, will chew very, very sparsely and um, it's a lovely, lovely smoothness to the, to the inside of the nut there. Squirrels, of course, bigger and bolshier. They will just often crack open things like hazelnuts. Um, they don't really 
care. <laughs> so like I said before, we're looking for this lovely smooth inside of a nut here, as opposed to uh, being gnawed all the way through the, what we would expect to see with a, a vole or a mouse. So moving on to squirrels, and like I said before, squirrels, they're a lot bigger. They don't really care about making a lot of mess. I'm sure lots of you have seen these uh, in your walks through the woodlands. So pine cones, this one has been thoroughly munched. So a squirrel will take a couple of pine cones, sit there on its tree, eat them like a corn on the cob, you know, from one end to the other, and then just sort of chuck them on the floor. So there aren't really any feeding differences between the red and the gray squirrel. So it's very much a, um, you're not looking for species when it comes to these feeding signs. You're looking very much for just squirrel or no squirrel. And like I said before, their prints are quite hard to find. I only found these because I was doing some footprint tunnel surveys for hedgehogs. And I was lucky enough to find some gray squirrel prints there, quite long, up to five centimeters. And then, Prints of uh, the mice and voles, which I like to call the, uh, the tiny poo crew, because the uh, small, small poos, small hands, very different, to, very difficult to tell the difference between mice and vole when it comes to footprints and poo. I tend to not as much because um, it's, it's a little bit different. I prefer to, uh, to rely on live trapping for things like that. Hopefully I could uh, go over how to do a bit of small mammal live trapping in, a, in, a, in another video. Let's have a look. <laughs> Watch this space. So a nice overview for our rodents here. So their prints are quite small. Chances are you won't see them out and about. Who again is very small. You won't see it out and about unless you find a nice latrine area. And then you're looking at something that's bigger than a grain of rice if it's going to be something a bit more interesting. As for their pickings, so nuts and things, they leave all over the place and we see little burrow holes all around and about. Any of those little very circular holes you see in banks, that's classic bank vole. You often see them in woodlands as well. And the great thing about rodents is you can find them absolutely everywhere. So they don't care about human beings, they will turn up in cities, in urban environments all over the place. So they're a lovely one to watch out for. So moving on quickly to the leopards. So leopard is just a fancy way of saying looks like a hare. And I like looking at these two side by side because they've got different strategies in how they uh, live their lives as a prey species. So rabbits are a lot smaller and they've got a lot stuntier, stocky legs. And so because they don't really run as fast, they like to burrow. And so they utilize burrows as a form of escape against predators. Whereas hares, they've got a much bigger eyes, much bigger ears and much bigger legs. And so their adaptation is essentially just running away. So brown hares don't dig burrows. They like to live in forms across the, um, so that's just on the top of some vegetation. And they like to utilize paths as well. So that's why they do so well in places like um, forestry and on wind farms. So really the only thing that we're looking for with the leopards is poo because they've got such hairy feet. They don't really leave footprints. I'm sure we've all seen rabbit poo. That's dark and round, quite like a raisin. Whereas hair is almost twice the size and we're looking for a much brown, uh, light brown, almost hay color. Both don't really smell. And uh, again, they'll be uh, deposited in clumps at various parts along the path, pretty much anywhere you go. So the leopards, they've got long slipper shaped feet. So that's what you're looking for if you think you found a print. It looks a bit like a slipper elongated at one end. So with their poo, again, we're looking for pellets, raisiny brown, dark brown pellets for rabbit, light hay colours for the hare, and they're slightly bigger. In terms of their pickings, we're really only looking for burrows for rabbits and then we're looking at things like forms and paths for hair. So I like this picture because this hair has clearly picked its path that it likes to hang out on. And of course, places, rabbits can be found absolutely everywhere. I've got a, a warren in the field opposite my house, which is wonderful. Um, hares, of course, prefer not to necessarily live in the company of humans and they like more rural environments and places that are a bit more upland, so they tend to do well on heaths, um, upland areas, commons and wind farms, like I say. Now moving on to insectivores, these are my sort of second favourite group. Now I've put insectivores in inverted commas there because technically that's not the scientific term for them. They used to be, but not anymore, because it turns out that pretty much all animals eat insects at some point. 
So insectivore is a bit of a misnomer when it comes to this group. The new name is Eulipetophila, which is Greek for small, fat and blind, which when I first read it, I thought that's a little bit insulting, those poor animals. But I thought about it and uh, shrews are quite small, hedgehogs are quite fat and moles are quite blind. So if anything, I actually think it's an improvement on the name, a lot more accurate. <laughs> so starting off with Mr. Blind Mole. So yes, their eyesight is not good at all as they spend most of their time underground. So they use the, uh, the hairs on their bodies and on their noses. They're amazing sensitive whiskers to learn how to get around. They're also unique in having these spade shaped hands. So they've got spade shaped hands with quite long claws and they'll use these hands to almost swim through the mud. So the skeleton of the hedgehog and the seal is actually quite different. So uh, hedgehog, moles, apologies. So moles have their limbs uh, at the sides of their bodies rather than underneath. So to help them with this swimming action when it comes to swimming through the mud. Another thing about moles is unfortunately if you see them out and about during the day they're, they're probably dead. This mole in this picture is dead. I thought I would just pose it nicely for a picture. But yes, so because moles are, of course, underground experts, they become very, very vulnerable when uh, they're above ground. And so moles tend to be very, very active in late August. So when the juveniles will come out of the uh, come out of their parents tunnels and move along above ground to find new territory is when they can come into trouble. So again, this is another mole that I found out and about. And I know it's a mole. I was a bit unsure at first, but I know it's a mole because those unique hands, no other animal in Britain has hands like that. So properly we're looking at little spades and arms sort of either side of the body rather than underneath. And remember what I said before about the importance of using a scale bar. That's why I've got my GPS in here. So a couple of my pictures have a couple of odd things in like my hand. So that's just to show scale. So I imagine because this is quite a small mole and I took this picture in late July, I think this is a young juvenile that has tried to find a new territory and unfortunately got a little bit squished along the way. And so last picture of a dead mole, I promise. So, but I like this one so much because this was on a path after a period of incredibly heavy rain. The, the water had clearly um, gone down enough to leave this poor little dead mole body in the crown of a fern as the water receded. And again, I know it's a mole, even though it's incredibly decomposed because those feet and that nose unique for uh, for moles so their their nose almost looks very very pig like very snout like um, naked as they need it to um, to be a, a super super sensitive when they're looking for uh, for worms and other food um, when they're burrowing so moving on to to shrews and and Again, unfortunately, if you're lucky enough to see a shrew for as long as this, chances are it is probably dead. <laughs> so shrews, um, although they do look a bit like rodents, they are not related to rodents at all. They don't have uh, the gnawing incisors. They actually have sharp spiky teeth from all the way from the back to the front of their jaws. And their back molars are actually tipped with red. So if you've ever done a owl palate dissection and found a little jaw with some red capped teeth, then that is from, from a shrew. And so the only really difference that you're looking for in our UK shrews is the difference between common and water shrew. So common shrews are brown pretty much all over. They do have a bit of a white belly, but the water shrew is very, very unique in that it has its lovely, lovely pale white belly and very dark going to black on the back. And so again, when you're looking at habitat when it comes to water shrew, but they will live in things like ponds, culverts going under roads so it's always worth having a think about what sort of animals that you've got in your area so you're probably only likely to come across water shrew unfortunately uh, through deceased specimens or if you're doing a bit of live trapping so again yes look for that white belly in uh, in water shrew that is the uh, the unique element that makes water shrew water shrew now moving on to their cousin the hedgehog the lovely fat hedgehog i love hedgehogs so hedgehogs are brilliant animals and I think they're so charismatic. Um, they were my species of study for a couple of years doing a bit of hedgehog work around Aberystwyth and so I was using mainly hedgehog tunnels to figure out where they were. So this is the copy of the sheet that is on this slide here and so it just goes to show that this is what it looks like in real life. So pop my paper 
on my stage here that goes right into the footprint tunnel. So I, I put this clip in here because typically you want an animal to do something and it won't ever give you the time of day. So this hedgehog is supposed to be walking through this tunnel here to eat the food and leave me some lovely footprints. But no, he's decided he's, he's an independent hedgehog and has just gone around the side there. But luckily I was able to get some, uh, get some prints and I, I love the hedgehog prints. So you'll generally see four toes, but they do have five. Sometimes you will see the five toes and it's very much like a human hand print. So I think their four, four paws look very much like human hands. And so there are quite um, a variety of different shapes and sizes that these paws come in. But again, they, they look a bit like someone's just put a little tiny human hand there. And we're looking at scale now. So these are A4 pieces of paper here. And uh, tunnel, uh, footprint tunnels are, are a really, really fun activity to get into. Um, please message me if you'd like some more information about how to get into that. It's uh, such a fun activity, especially during lockdown. And so hedgehogs, they have quite nice poo, I must say. It comes out quite brown and sticky, but hardens up to a nice brown, uh, dark black, dark brown, black colour. Um, tends to not smell and often has nice shiny bits in because... Hedgehogs like to eat beetles, things with nice hard carapaces. That means that they obviously can't digest those hard pieces and it comes out in the poo. So poo is generally never, ever bigger than a thumb. When you think about the size of a hedgehog, they can't actually poo anything bigger. So here's a nice uh, reference picture with a matchstick. I think that's a nice reference for uh, how big hedgehog poo can be. Now, just a looking at the hedgehog species in focus. So their prints look like tiny human hands with five toes. Their poo isn't very big and is often dark brown or black in colour. Not really looking for many pickings other than hibernation nests or a breeding nest. And you can find them mostly in gardens and other sort of cultivated green spaces. They like hedgerows. Unfortunately, that's why they're not doing so well in uh, rural areas, but certainly in urban environments, Gardens are really um, a, a key element in uh, hedgehog survival, having a good garden with good connections into other gardens. Moving on to carnivores now. Now, uh, I'm sure a few of you even have a carnivore living at home at the moment, a cat or a dog. So we don't actually have wild cats in Wales at the moment. But so we're mostly uh, just going to be looking at the fox today. So carnivores, again, named so because of their amazing canine teeth so they're um fantastic uh prey species so these are one of our prey species the fox so the fox will go after things like the rodents the leopards the rabbits and hares and would even take a hedgehog if it can but generally the only animal that predates on hedgehogs is badgers because they have the the really big claws so with fox you're mostly going to be looking at prints and poo so here's just a breakdown of the differences between dog and fox prints essentially Fox prints are a lot bigger, a lot longer and more uh, diagonal shaped. It said you can draw a cross through a fox print without touching either of the toes or the pad in the middle. Similarly, you can break a fox print into three sort of individual pieces, whereas with a dog print, you can't really do that. It's a much more circular, much more rounded sort of print. And you can almost draw a rainbow semicircle through all four of the prints. It's very similar with the cat, but because cats have retractable claws, they will very, very rarely show a claw in the print. So again, think about your place, think about human activity. If you see a four-toed print when you're out and about, especially if it's a place where humans are, chances are it's going to be a dog. So just for an example, I've taken a picture when I was out and about walking a friend's dog of mine. So this is your classic dog print. So we've got the four toes here. We've got one, two, three, four claws along the top and a circular pad in the middle. So we can draw our little semicircle there that's showing us that that's not a fox print. We can't break it up into three individual pieces. So that's definitely a dog. So one thing that you can, sh can, <laughs> can identify that is very much foxy is their poo. Their poo is not very nice in any way. So it is probably the worst smelling poo. I absolutely hate it because carnivores, of course, are carnivores and they eat meat. Um, their poo is stinking and often has bits and bobs of whatever animal that they've just eaten inside. So this one has a little bit of fur in it. This one has the tip of a feather quill in it there. Bits and bobs from 
other feather bits. So fox is a brilliant one to do the stick test when it comes to poo. Grab a stick, poke it in the poo, bring the stick to your nose, and if you physically recoil from the horrificness of the smell, it's probably a fox poo. So another thing that foxes leave behind, of course, are their prey remains. So this is the lovely remains of a wood pigeon, unfortunately. But if we're going to use a bit of more our detective skills, I, I, I thought this was really interesting because when I first saw this, I thought immediately, oh, a fox. Lovely. I'll have that for my presentation. And then I looked further and actually when we zoom into to these feathers and we actually have a look, we see we know that it's going to be a fox or a carnivore because it's the feather has been shorn off at the end. It's been ripped off. So this is different to how it would be in a sparrowhawk or a bird of prey. They tend to pluck things so the feather stays completely intact. But I also noticed that all of these feathers are still in their quill shaft. So this is what um, this is how feathers grow. So it's technically in pin. So it's still having a blood supply to these feathers. And pretty much a lot of, if not the majority of these feathers are still in their growth stage. So that made me think. Wood pigeon, where are the baby wood pigeons? Baby wood pigeons are up a tree. So that made me think, well, it's probably not a fox. Chances are this could be a cat kill that's later been disturbed by a fox. It's always about thinking about what your animals are doing, not just your predator, but also your prey as well. And now I don't know what the outcome for this one is, but just thought I'd uh, put it in there for a little bit of excitement. So like I said before, difference between bird of prey kill so birds of prey are a lot smaller and obviously because they don't have hands, they have to remove feathers individually by plucking them with their own beaks. So a sparrowhawk kill would look very uh, dissipated. So the feathers are pretty much sprayed all over the place, very rarely in chunks. So with this fox, um, you can see that there's almost like a, a handful of feathers here in the middle, as opposed to the sparrowhawk, which is just sort of flown all over the place. So that's how you know the difference between a carnivore kill and a bird of prey kill. So yeah, looking at that clumpy features from, from a carnivore kill. So to round up with Foxy, we're looking at long prints, can often cut them up into three, three, uh, three distinct boxes or draw across through them. Poo, stinky, I hate it, it's the worst and I smell a lot of mammal poo. So we're looking at cylindrical shapes often with fur, pointy at one end because carnivore poo does that. In terms of their pickings, so we're looking for prey remains, feathers, bits of dead animal, um, and their den sites. So foxes will take over rabbit burrows like in this picture because they don't tend to dig themselves, their paws really aren't adapted for it. And you can find foxes pretty much anywhere. They tend to not really care about humans. It's a, it's a lot more of a sort of behavioural preference thing whether they, they like being around people or not. Okay, moving on to my favourite group. I love the mustelids so much. So mustelid, I'm, that's where we get the word musty from. Because I'm sure you know, humans, we have sweat glands to, uh, to keep us cool. Mustelids have scent glands and they have these scent glands on their belly and around their bum and they use those to communicate with each other. So these smells can say anything from I am new in the area and I'd like to meet a sexy other mustelid friend or it could say this is my territory get lost or it could say I'm feeling pretty sexy does anybody want to meet up and have a get together so it can mean a variety of different things and so when I say about poo smelling some of this scent also transfers into the poo so mustelid poo has a very very unique odour and between the different mustelid species you can sort of pick up on the differences between between their own individual individual smells so starting with the smallest mustelids probably won't ever find field signs of these in the wild again unless you're looking at prey remains so stoats are classically a little bit bigger than weasels so they've got the lovely black tip at the end there and like I said slightly bigger than weasels weasels are our smallest carnivore I think they're the smallest carnivore in Europe so a weasel size think uh, about an adult wedding ring so it said that the head of a weasel can fit through the wedding ring of a man so imagine how small that predator is to go through through a ring and that that size animal can bring down a rabbit a fully grown rabbit which I think is just fantastic so 
Muscolid group are another fantastic group because they have five toes. So that's why I get super, super excited whenever I'm out and about, um, especially if it's somewhere where people walk dogs. And so I'm saying, oh, four toe print, four toe print. And I see a five toe print. Oh, that's something interesting. So this is when I, again, I like to use my little cheat sheet because although mustelids have got five toes, looking at the placement of the toes is very handy when it comes to mustelid. So this one is mink, and I know this because of my place where I was. I was on a, a nature reserve. I'm not going to say which one because it's got mink. <laughs> uh, and it was right by the water. And so we're looking at the two weasel members of the weasel family who like water. We're looking at otter and we're looking at American mink. Um, and American mink don't have the um, webbed feet that otters do. And they often tend to show a little bit more claw compared to otter. So I use my, uh, my cheat sheet and we've got the splayed, splayed toes of mink here showing the claw at the top. So I'm happy to say that that one is a mink. And another thing, again, like I said about them being musty, their poo tends to smell a lot. So with the smaller mustelids, so we're looking at polecat and below, their poo tends to be quite foul smelling. So the old English name for polecat is actually foul mart. So they smell very foul. Compare that with the pine martin, that's old English name is sweet mart, because they tend to give off quite a nice sweet smell. So I'm sure if you've ever hit, hit a polecat with your car, sometimes the smell can actually still be on your car. It's, oh, it's horrible, especially if you accidentally get it on your hands like I once did. It took a numerous amount of washings to get that smell off my hands, I can tell you. So again, we're looking at scale bars whenever we're taking pictures of poo. With this one on the left, I wasn't quite sure whether it was a stoat or a polecat. Again, it doesn't really matter in terms of species. I know from the smell and from the twisted nature of this poo that it's almost certainly a mustelid. And so that's still an important record because that gives you um, an indication on what to look for, um, maybe how to put out a camera trap or something if you're wanting to find out exactly who did it. So pine martins I've included a little bit because of course they're going to be spreading out of mid Wales now. So we know that we've got pine martins in Carmarthenshire, I think pretty much all of the old counties, all the big old counties. And this map is a little bit old even, so I know that they're even down almost into Pembrokeshire now. And probably all the way up here. I think all of this map's green to be honest. Pine martins, they are, they are becoming more and more um, frequently sighted across Wales. And for someone that was involved in that project, that's just fantastic for me. So they're, again, quite unique looking members of the weasel family. They've got that lovely creamy bib and cat ears that stick up on their heads a bit like satellite dishes. So their poo is quite lovely poo. I think it's my favourite poo. They poo in a very odd way, but almost like kicking their bum out at the end, which means that almost always it looks a bit like an S shape, either an S or a uh, question mark or something like that. Um, Johnny Burks, who wrote the book about the Pine Martin, um, there's a lovely picture in there of his A to Z of Pine Martin poo shapes. And that's all of these poos that he's collected um, from A, B, C all the way down to Z, all in their natural Pine Martin shapes. And another thing about Pine Martin poo is that some people say it smells like Palmer violets. Now, I disagree. I think it smells a bit like silage or haylage. It's definitely got a, a wet smell, but it's not necessarily unpleasant. There's a, there's a sweetness to it, definitely. And like I said before, they use this poo to communicate. So this is on top of one of our den boxes that we put up for them. And this Pine Martin is essentially saying to everyone else, excuse me, this is my house. I have pooed on top of it. No one else come into my house. So that's a fant <laughs> fantastic sight. It was quite difficult for us to get the, uh, the poo off the top of the box on this one, to be honest. It was very, very heavy. So moving on to a, another mustelid species, um, the otter. So again, otters are quite unique in terms of their aquatic environment. They're, um, they're the only um, mustelid that we have that has webbed feet. And they have very fishy smelling poo, quite perhaps unsurprisingly, they like to eat um, fish, crabs, freshwater invertebrates, other things like shrimps, other crustaceans. And so that means that their poo often smells very fishy, but also has these lovely bits in it as well. So you can see fish bones, bits of crab, all sorts inside an otter poo. 
So the only thing that you can really mix it up with is mink poo. And so we're both looking at that slightly mustard smell, whereas mink smells absolutely foul. Like it almost smells like something has died in the poo. So again, that's how you can tell the difference. People say that otter spray smells like jasmine tea. I don't believe it, but like I said, it certainly smells better than mink poo. So when we're looking at otter prints, we are looking for the five toes of the muster lid again, but we're also looking for a unique webbed look. And so this gives the paws a very sort of spiky look because rather than being really big claws, it's just the way that the print sinks in and brings the front of the claws downwards. So they've got quite a large print, about five to eight centimetres long um, on the hind foot, and they'll often leave their tail behind them if, uh, if you're lucky enough to get one on a sandy bank or a muddy bank or something like that. So their poo, often very fishy with lots of bits and bobs in it. Their pickings, again, quite similar, crabs, shrimps, fish bones, bits of fish just left lying around. And of, of, of course, they're um, in more sort of aquatic environments. They can hang out um, on seaside. So don't um, ever think that you're not gonna get a, a otter swimming in seawater because they will do. Um, in Aberystwyth, in 2020 we had one living in the harbour for about two weeks and thankfully it was during um, when we weren't locked down so that was a lovely thing to go see every day. Um, yes yeah, so that's otters. So moving on to our largest member of the weasel family, Mr Badger. So badgers are fantastic, they have again a unique footprint, we've got the five toes but they've got very very fat toes and they've got four toes almost along the top with a little tiny Thumb on the side there. We've also got huge claws, almost bigger than the toes themselves, and this lovely big fat pad at the bottom there. And so again, we're thinking about our cheat sheet, we're thinking about the toes at the top, we can see the little thumb at the side there, and again the claws. No other animal, no other no, not even, not even carnivores have has claws these big. These are adapted for the badger's digging lifestyle because not only do they live in sets, they also like to dig to find things to eat, things like um, bluebell bulbs and things like that. So in this picture is a badger toilet. I'll give you five seconds to see if you can spot it whilst I take a quick drink. Now, I don't know why, but in this woodland in particular, in Pant, Pantdar woodland near Aberystwyth, the badgers just love pooing next to the path. I don't know whether it's because the soil is, is looser, I have no idea, but badgers are funny old animals in that they like to poo as a family. I say funny, I suppose we do it as humans. They're very, very clean, so badgers will never poo inside their set, so underground they like to use that area specifically for sleeping. So they won't poo there, they won't eat there, and they will poo in a pit or, um, as more commonly known, a badger latrine. So badgers will do a little scrape of, uh, of the soil and then the f all of the family uh, will poo in the same pit until that pit sort of fills up and then they'll just move on to another pit. Now, I, I don't know if it's, just, if it's just myself, but I've noticed that certain latrines will come back into usage so maybe once a year, once uh, the, the mat, the organic matter has been broken down, the badgers will come back and use that toilet area again. And sometimes they don't bother digging a hole. Sometimes they'll just make a big mound of poo. And so it's very uh, cylindrical, almost looks quite dog, but you can tell by the smell that it's definitely not dog poo. In the, in the autumn, it can sometimes uh, be white speckled with all the berry seeds that they eat because of course they're omnivores they change their diet throughout the year so their poo can look pretty different depending on the time of year but like I said you're looking for the latrine you're looking for the the big mound of poo no other animal will poo like that and so because badgers are such large animals they tend to be habitat modifiers they change things quite a lot and so one thing that I like to do when I'm out and about is following badger trails so as we can see from this picture we've got a line of baked, not baked, we've got a line of earth here that's been um, crushed down from many passages of many badgers. And an interesting thing to look for when you see this sort of thing coming under fences is for barbed wire. And so if you are lucky enough to find some hair on the barbed wire, 
always run it through your fingers because if you, for example, take some of your own hair and you rub that through your fingers. So we're looking at one hair, run it through your fingers and you probably won't feel anything. You won't feel any resistance because the cross section of a human hair is circular. A badger's hair, however, is triangular. So if you run that through your fingers, you will feel ridges as it stops on each side. So that's something really interesting to uh, have a look for when you're out and about and start taking things off fences and rolling them between your fingers. Because even though horse hair is much thicker and it almost feels like a badger hair, again, that will have the round cross section of a human hair. So it's not quite the same. Again, badgers, you're thinking lower down, less than three foot in height. So if we follow badger paths through the woodland, it's a lovely thing to do and sometimes, you know, can take you some places that you've not been before, but can also help you find badger sets, of course. So badgers, famous diggers, fresh earth will always um, highlight a fresh and active set. So not only are we looking at fresh earth, we're also looking for a clearance of vegetation. Because if you can imagine you have a set of five to ten badgers all of these badgers pile out in the middle of the night and this is where they hang out this is where they play and they chat to each other and they groom each other and of course there is nothing there on the ground all of their moving around has disturbed the ground so much that nothing can grow back so this is what we're looking for in an active badger set as soon as you get a bit of bramble moving up things blocking the hole lots of dead leaves you know that that badgers that has been vacated and that there aren't any animals in that particular area anymore. So just doing a quick summary for the badger, they have a very big fat print, um, looking for four toes in the line and the little thumb, looking for claws on the top as well, really big claws, fat and cylindrical poo often in their pit uh, or a badger latrine, it's a fancy word, changeable of course due to the diet uh, changing through the year. They're picking, so we're looking at digging, we're looking for half-eaten bulbs, crushed vegetation, denning activity, digging activity, things like that. And you can find them, again, they're pretty ubiquitous, tend to favour places away from humans, so things like uh, woodlands, back edges of farms and um, other rural areas. Although some people are lucky enough to get them in their gardens. I've not had one in mine yet, but um, still got my fingers crossed. And so now moving on to our final, our final group, we're going to look at the bats very, very quickly. So bats, of course, because they are true flyers, they don't come to the ground really, and so they don't leave prints lying around. So what we're looking for is poo. So I'm part of North Caridigian Bat Group, and this is my lovely friend Aileen, who is chair. Um, we were called to this building. Um, because a small little bat had been found and we were trying to find where the roost entrance was to pop him back in. Um, and we found here a huge lot of poo. So all of this tiny little brown, these are individual poos. And now one thing that I like to do between, um, to, guess, uh, to work out whether you've got a mouse poo or a bat poo is the scrunch test essentially. So you pop the poo on your hand or another flat surface, get your finger, scrub, scrub, scrub at the poo, and if you can blow it away to dust, literally just, it's a bat poo. But if it's a mouse poo, it'll smear the surface that it's on. Because bats, they eat insects. And all of, all of the goodness, all of the juiciness from the insects gets absorbed whilst it's being digested. And so bats excrete the hard things, the shells, the wings, carapaces, things that they don't like to eat. And so it will often break down very, very easily. And so we thought, this looks great. This looks definitely like a roost entrance. So when bats come in and come out of their roost, especially first time for the night, they'll often evacuate because they've been there all night and their bladders are a little bit full. So they will often poo and pee as soon as they leave the roost. And sure enough, in that little yellow circle was the roost entrance. And we were able to um, take the baby back and we were able to count out over a hundred bats that night. And that was fantastic because not only do we do we now know where there are another um, 100 bats, which is great for our records, but it also means that the property owner is now aware that they have a roost and they are also um, interested in counting it now for the future. So again, 100 bats is fantastic. So just to round up for our bats here, so we are looking for no prints really as they don't really walk around. We're looking at tiny black brown poo that you can crush to dust and blow away. 
In terms of their pickings, we're only looking for things for the larger moths, so nocturals and brown long-eared moth wings, beetle bodies, that sort of thing, and place. So you can find bats pretty much all over the place. They like woodlands, old buildings, but you will sometimes find pipistrelle bats in newer build houses. Uh, it's important to note that um, all roosts are, of course, protected by law. So it doesn't matter how many bats you've got in your roost, if you have a roost, then um, it is protected from disturbance. If you ever are, well, I say fortunate, fortunate for you and lucky for the bat to ever find a bat out during the day, hanging out on the wall or something like this, the uh, Bat Conservation Trust does have a helpline number here. And so I would um, highly recommend that you give that a call if you ever find a bat in trouble. Um, so a, uh, a trained person on the other end can give you a little bit of advice to start with and then they'll pass your call on to somebody like myself, a local bat carer who can hopefully help you out with some further steps and maybe even take the bat into care. So that's uh, our roundup of the mammals. So moving on to our quick quiz round. So I thought you've had a lot of information thrown at you this evening so I won't be too hard on you. So we'll look at different pictures. We have eight to go through and with a couple of little notes to maybe help you decide on what you think you've got. So we'll start off with this first image. Now, I expect all of you who know will already know what animal this is. Of course, it's the mole. So we're looking at mole hills, disturbance from the ground from all of their digging. So mole hills, even though you can't see the mole, an active mole hill is a record of a mole. So if you um, want to record on iRecord or on WWBIC, these records are still valid and important for recording mammal activity in the area. So moving on to a feeding sign here, we're looking at pine cones in the woodland. No footprints, so it was dropped from above. So we're thinking about an arboreal species that eats pine cones. Again, quite an easy one, squirrel. And if you remember me saying earlier, you can't tell the difference between the species of squirrel just on their feeding, what they leave behind. So it's always uh, important to think about the simplest answer is obviously the most likely, Occam's razor. So chances are it's probably going to be a grey squirrel. But if you're in an area where reds are present, it's worth maybe putting out a camera trap or something if you're able to. So our first poo question. So as we see, we've got a pen here to use as a scale. So this is a, brand, a regular biro pen here. So we're looking at a poo that is longer than 15 centimetres. It's also a very, very smelly poo and it's full of fur. So we can see a lot of white colour fur in there. That could even be wool. So we're looking at a predator animal here. that has got a very smelly poo with lots of fur in it. Now, how many of you thought fox? Because that is absolutely correct. So foxes, we're looking at the incredibly smelly poo. So it smells almost very deathly in its, in its smell. And also very large. So we're thinking about an animal that's the size of about a medium sized dog here. So about 15 centimeters. And of course, think about what the fox has been eating as well. So it'll have prey elements within that poo. Another poo question. So we're looking at poo in a pit. It's cylindrical and it doesn't smell too bad. Thinking about where we are as well in the woodland here. So this is of course a badger latrine. So poo in a pit, it's almost always going to be a badger, especially when there are multiple poos per pit as well. So we're looking at a family's worth of poo and because it's badger, because it's mustelid, It'll have that sort of faint, sweet smell around it, but it will change throughout the year, depending on what the animal's been eating. Now, footprint question here. We're looking at prints by water. It's actually on sand here, which is uh, why they've left such quite nice footprints. We're looking for five toes and we're looking for a webbed foot. Now, because this photo hasn't got a scale in it, it's actually quite difficult to tell what these prints are, but if you put together what clues that you do have, we're looking for five toes and we're looking for webbed feet. So we know that five toes is either mustelid or a hedgehog. And so obviously by the water, it's probably not going to be a hedgehog. So think about your mustelids. Which mustelids by water? We're thinking of either mink or otter. And then which one has the webbed foot? Of course, it's the otter. And I think this lovely little trail mark here is from the tail. 
which is why I, I particularly like this photo in particular. Moving on to another poo here. So we're looking for a quite small poo. I think that's an apple core there. So this poo is less than four centimeters. So we're looking for a medium sized mammal, I think, to make this poo. This poo was found in the garden and it's also full of insect pieces. So we can just see some nice sort of itty bitty bits in, in, in that poo there. So we're looking for a small poo that's found in the garden by a medium sized animal. And those of you that are lucky enough to get them in your garden, keep an eye out for some hedgehog poo, especially as we come out of, uh, of the winter into the warmer months. So always worth looking out for hedgehog. Now this one is a little bit on the brown side, but as we can see by this well-chomped apple, I think this hedgehog has been utilising other sources of food in this garden. So again, that's what can make the poo quite changeable, is diet. But fundamentally, it stays the same. Okay, next we're looking at a footprint. So we have a footprint here that has very long, large claws, four toes in a line here with another toe down here. And it also looks like it's a very large pad. And this little field notes also says that there's digging nearby because I thought I'd put in an extra clue for you, but I'm sure you don't need it. All those five toes along with those very, very large claws, there's no one else it can be apart from the badger. Now, last question, and it's a poo question. So we have two poos in this picture. So we have the poo down here, which is scaled by my hand, and we have another little poo on the top here. So this is an animal that likes to communicate through poo, likes to communicate through smell. And so these poos were found in the woodland. They're dark and slimy poos, and they smell quite musty. So think about where you are in terms of place. Think about, in poo in terms of communication? Are there some animals that you scent more than others? And I'll be, uh, give yourself an extra pat on the back if you got this one right, because this is the poo of the pine martin. So I was very lucky to find this poo up in the arch, um, so that's near Comistwith um, in Ceredigion. So I was very happy about this. So this is the poo from two different martins that were visiting this stump to sort of uh, talk to each other through their poo. So moving on to our resources. So give yourself a, a big round of applause for that poo quiz. It wasn't, wasn't, wasn't very easy, but um, I'm hoping that you've picked up at least a couple of things from tonight's presentation. So we have Mammal Detective. This is one of the, well, this is the book that I suppose inspired me to, uh, to do this presentation and to properly get into mammal tracks and signs. It's a fantastic book. You can get it in your secondhand bookshops or um, independent bookshops for around about a tenner. It's a mixture of um, ecology notes with some lovely pictures, pictures of poo, pictures of um, footprints and habitats and things like that. Um, again, got some lovely drawings in there of some nests, some pickings that you can look out for. So that's a nice medium range price book that you can get. Lovely book there by Rob Strachan. Another lovely book that you can get is the um, British Mammals Guide, which is um, a lovely photographic guide. So it's not got illustrations, it's got lovely photo prints in there and it covers all British mammals. So that's the terrestrial mammals as well as the marine animals, so seals and cetaceans and things like that. Gives a lot more background into their general ecology as well. So this is less tracks and signs and more just the general ecology of our, of our animals that we have. So this book goes between 15 to 25 pounds, depending on where you find it and depending on if there's a sale. It makes a brilliant gift for any budding naturalist. And I think it's well suitable for um, the ages about 16 plus, or if you have a very, very confident child reader as well. I think this one's great. And of course they have, um, there's a wealth of um, other resources that you can get. I would recommend the FSC pullout guides. They're very, very cheap at about three pound 50. I haven't got the up-to-date mammal one and I really, really want it. I need to go to the bookshop when lockdown's over and get myself one of those. But if you don't want to spend any money, there are so many resources that you can find online. So Mammal Society, People's Trust for Endangered Species, they are especially good for things like Dormouse and Otter. So they have whole guides on how to set up um, management for those different types of species as well. And the RSPB has got a lot of mammal information as well. They're not just a bird charity, they are a wildlife charity as well. 
And if you wanted to explore a bit of mammal uh, anatomy using owl pellets, the Barn Owl Trust is a fantastic place to look for resources and to use for identification tips as well. So they have photorealistic, um, not photo, they have photos of all of the sort of mammal bits and bobs that you can find within owl pellets with a lovely scale bar that you can use to measure your own specimens. And I suppose at the end of the day, a good thing about learning, uh, the, about having the ability to identify mammal tracks and signs is so that you can record them. And recording data on species abundance and species distribution is really important for conservation because without that baseline information, we don't know what to do in terms of our work. So the local environmental record centres in Wales, there are four of them. My one is WWBIC because um, I live in the southwest um, and so I like to upload my records on the website but there are apps available for each of the um, all four um, LERC groups. You can also check out records on um, a Derin, which is a, which is a fantastic dis, uh, data distribution um, website where you can search for different species across Wales. So mammals, plants, insects, anything, give it a look. If you're outside of Wales, you can also use apps like Project Splatter. Now this one is a roadkill specific app and I like to use it quite a lot because it's very, very interesting to see the sort of uh, the sort of data that they get and if you follow them on Facebook or Twitter they do a weekly update showing the uh, the most uh, the most killed animal of the week which is very interesting because it allows us to have a look at their behavior and we can sort of map when youngsters are around or leaving the nest or things like that from 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 that data. Mammal Mapper as well as another fantastic nationwide species map so if you are say going to holiday in Scotland and you see a wild cat over in Scotland pop it on the mammal mapper so that when you come back to come back home to Wales and you're using your uh, your lurk your lurk apps you don't miss that record uh, being recorded because like I said at the end of the day every record matters whether you see the animal or not just have a think give it five seconds and try and record it if you can. So thank you so much for listening. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to follow me on Twitter. Um, my handle is at the start of the presentation and I'm more than happy to take any questions anytime about anything. So yeah, thank you very much for listening and go out, find some stuff, smell some